All right, well, if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And as you're turning there, I heard a story of a man who was walking on the beach. And this is a joke, all right? So don't be offended, all right? It's a joke. The man was walking on the beach, and all of a sudden, man, the Lord uh, spoke to him and said, Hey, listen, you've been a faithful servant, and I'm going to give you one request. Whatever, whatever you ask, I'm going to give it to you. And so the man said, Well, Lord, I, you know, I would always, I've always wanted to go to Hawaii, but you know I'm afraid to fly, so can you build me a bridge from here all the way to Hawaii? And the Lord said, Well, you know, I could do that, but logistically, it would probably bankrupt America trying to keep up with that bridge and all the money that it would take, so... Uh, I'm going to have to pass on that. I can't, I can't do that for you. Think of something else. And so he said, all right, well, Lord, I, I would, or I, I, I'm going to ask that you give me the knowledge of understanding women completely, why they feel the way they feel, and why they think the way they think, and why they do what they do, and how they change their mind. And, and the Lord said, after a pause, do you want two lanes or four? <laughs> right? Oh, come on, come on. All right, all right. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> all right, that, next Sunday I'll tell a man joke, all right? How about that? Yeah. All right. All right, Matthew chapter 24, and we're continuing our series on the end times, and we're going to really, truly get into this, and I'm hoping to get some PowerPoints and different things along the way, but there's just a, a few things where the Lord just keeps stopping me that He really has laid on my heart to express that He wants, I believe, with all my heart to get across to all of us concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that is the next great prophetic event on God's calendar is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And let's look there at verse number 32 and 33. The Bible says this, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. Now the fig tree, you remember, is Israel. Alright, this is one of the greatest signs of our time that we are, at, we are in the last days. We are close to the end of the last days. Uh, Israel became a nation May 14, 1948. That was one of the greatest signs, one of the greatest prophecies to be fulfilled. Uh, and so he says, learn the parable of the fig tree. Well, that fig tree blossomed and ripened on May 14, 1948. When its branches are yet tender and put it forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, now all these things is referring to everything that he said prior to this in Matthew 24. And we're going to get into all those things, but we're going to get into all those things next Sunday. Because I want you to see what God's laid on my heart. So he says, so likewise, when you see, you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now there's an argument that says that a generation is 40 years biblically. Well, we know that's not true because 40 years have gone by since Israel became a nation. Well, then some people say, well, no, it's, uh, it's, it's 60 years. And then there's some that say that it's 80 years. Some say it's 84 years. But we do know that there's going to be a generation, depending on what the Lord the Lord in his mind, when he made that statement, how many days or how many years that exactly is, we don't know. But we do know that the time is very short and that we're there. And the Bible says that Jesus is right at the door looking at his perspective. And this is what we want to talk about. I want to bring you a message entitled, An Interview with Jesus About the Second Coming of Christ. An Interview with Jesus About the Second Coming of Christ. If we had the ability to interview Jesus Christ and were to ask him, Lord, how do you feel about your second coming? What goes through your heart? What goes through your mind when you think about the second coming and coming back for your saints to rescue them, to take them off this planet, to bring your saints all the way back to the Mount of Olives, to bring your saints back to the Battle of Armageddon uh, as the saints are going to appear according to the book of Jude. So if we could interview Jesus and ask him how he felt about it, what goes through his heart, what through his mind, it's important that we understand his heart and it's an important that we understand his mind concerning the second coming of Christ because oftentimes when we look at the end days or the last days we look at the signs and we look at all the wonders and all the different things that are going to take place but we always look at it from our perspective but it's so vitally crucially important that we see the second coming through his lenses through his perspective because it'll give you a greater appreciation for who he is it'll also fuel your anticipation for his return for his coming to give you that expectancy that we all need that God wants us to have in all of our hearts concerning His second coming. So let's go to the Lord in prayer 
And let's consider that subject, an interview with Jesus about the second coming. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray now with all my heart that you'll touch me, anoint me, do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. Lord, you tell us very clearly, the flesh profits nothing, but it's your spirit that quickens. So Lord, I just pray that you'll, for your name's sake, for mercy's sake, touch me, anoint me, and Lord, let your words go forth in power. I pray that you'll use your words to encourage, to strengthen your people, to give them the anticipation that, Lord, you would so desire for them to have. Lord, help us to see your perspective in your heart, your attitude concerning the second coming of you. And so, Lord, we just ask again, if there's anyone lost, that you would save them in this service. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Many people ask, are we in the end times? Well, the answer to that question is yes, we are in the end times, but there's a greater question, a more important question, a more specific question that we need to ask uh, that needs to be answered. Now, understand, according to the Word of God, uh, that all the prophecies given in Daniel, the prophecies given in the New Testament concerning the second coming of Christ, the Word of God tells us that from the time Jesus Christ died on the cross and when he was raised from the dead, that was the moment that we entered into what's known as the last days or the end times. You know, a lot of people don't see or realize that, but that is absolutely the case. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John 2.18, listen to what he says now, children, it is the last days. He's speaking to the people of his day, but he's also referring to us. Children, it is the last days or the last time. As you have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even there are many Antichrists in the world, whereby uh, we know that this is the last days or the last time. So he tells us very clearly, the last days uh, were even considered in Jesus' time. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, uh, notice what the Word of God says concerning the last days. In verse number 11, he well, let me just back up to verse number 9. He talks about all the different countries that were there on the day of Pentecost. And then in verse 11, he says, The Cretes and the Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So the apostles were speaking uh, in different languages that they didn't learn. God the Holy Spirit came and gave them that ability so that people could understand in their own language. And they were uh, giving praises on the wonderful works of God, according to verse 11. Then he says this in verse 12. And they were all amazed. And were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this, or what does this mean? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judah, and all that dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is which the prophet Joel has spoken, and it shall come to pass in the last days, Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. If you were to continue to read, that prophecy was concerning the day of Pentecost, but also days even past our future. So the Word of God teaches us that we are in what's known as the last days, and it started at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. So the question we need to ask is this. Are we at the beginning? Are we at the very beginning, the very end of the last days? Is that where we're at, Brother Day? Are we at the very beginning, at the beginning of the end of the last days? Are we at the very end of that? And I believe that we are, and we're going to see that as we move through this series uh, and look. But let's interview, let's interview Jesus. Now, we're going to interview Jesus based on His Word, of course, because He's given us His heart here on printed page, the Holy Bible. And so it's important that we know His heart concerning the second coming. You know, as a leader, as a pastor... You know, you have to build a relationship with your people so they can get to know your heart. You know, it's hard to follow somebody if you don't know their heart. Well, the more that we know the Lord's heart, and the more that we know His attitude concerning the second coming, I guarantee you it will, man, help you appreciate the Lord so much more. It will truly give you the anticipation that you need uh, when it comes to the second coming. Now, understand this. The first coming of Christ had 300 and 33 prophecies concerning the first coming of the return of Jesus Christ. How he would come, and how he would die on the cross, and how he would pay for our sins on Calvary. How he suffered the wrath of God in our place so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, but that we could have heaven forever. 333 times God said that. Now all God has to do is say something once, and it's true forever, amen? But when the Lord repeats himself, that shows you the passion of his heart. You remember last Sunday, 
We talked about <clears throat> false teachers. That was something near and dear to the Lord Jesus. In fact, there was a professor in 1955 who got his seminary students to do a study of the Bible. And he says, I want you to look into the New Testament and see what theme or what subject pops up the most. And at the end of that study, they concluded that more than love, more than unity, that false teachers was something that popped up more than anything else. Why? Because the Lord is our shepherd and he has a heart to protect you and wants you to learn sound, hygienic doctrine. Amen? So you can see the passion of his heart. He wants True doctrine being taught to his people. Amen? He wants that good food for you. Well, in the same way, when Jesus Christ repeats himself over and over concerning his coming, that is something that is near and dear to his heart. Amen? Well, now understand this. <clears throat> if you were to statistically look at all the verses that concern the second coming of Christ, the one out of 25 pages in your Bible we'll talk about the second coming. One in 25 pages deals with the second coming of Christ in your Bible. Now, depending on what version you have, it might be one in 30, but man, that's one time that God mentions it every 25 pages. Wow. Guys, listen to this. There were 333 for his first coming, but there's 1,845 references to the second coming of Christ. The Lord Jesus speaks more about his second coming than he does his first. And when you put all that together, man, that is 2,178 times the Bible mentions his second coming. And so if God is going to mention the second coming that many times, we know that it's important to him and it should be important to us as well. Amen? Boy, it should. Because it's a subject that is near and dear to his heart. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are 17 books that mention the second coming of Christ. Not just the first coming, but the second coming. In the New Testament, 23 out of the 26 mentioned the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus Christ himself, when he was on earth, mentioned the second coming 21 times verbally out of his own mouth. So it's a subject that truly is near and dear to his heart, and one must have a good understanding of how the Lord feels, how the Lord sees the second coming, if we're going to be good students, if we're going to understand his heart, because if we don't, we're going to miss a big part of God's will and a big part of God's heart for our heart and for our lives. Let me ask you a question. When a man or a woman jumps from an airplane at 25,000 feet, that's a long ways up, amen? Do you think that person or that man or woman is more concerned about the style of shoes they have, what brand of shoes they have, what color their shirt is, uh, who's going to win the football game, uh, how much money they have in the bank account? Do you think they're... Focusing on that when they're jumping out of an airplane 25,000 feet. Now, their, their perspective is how far am I from the what? The ground. And they're consumed with this parachute deploying. Amen? That's what they're focused on. That's what's important because everything else doesn't become important when you're focusing on that. Amen? Well, a parachute, I found out, I, I, I investigated, an average parachute weighs 31 pounds. Well, that's a lot of weight on your back, amen? Now, if I were to give everyone in this service a parachute, and I were to tell you, hey, listen, you have to wear this 31-pound parachute for the rest of the service, and then you have to wear it for the remaining next eight hours of your day. Now, by wearing this parachute, it's going to make your life more comfortable, and it's going to bring lots of convenience to you. Now, do you think that would be a true statement? Now, you probably after the first half hour say, this dumb parachute, you would probably take it off, and say, why in the world would somebody tell me this would make, make my life better? It would bring me comfort and more convenience. All it did was the opposite. I don't want nothing to do with that parachute, and they take it off. Boy. Hmm. But now if I were to give you that 31-pound parachute as you were getting onto an airplane, and said, hey, listen, you're going to need this parachute because this volcano is about to erupt. This island is going to be completely over, overflowing with lava. This is the last plane off the island. This plane only has enough gas to get you up into the air, 25,000 feet, and then it's going to run out of gas. So you're going to need this parachute to save your life. Now, do you think for a second that you would complain about the weight of that parachute? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't even notice the weight, would you? Why? Because that person is focused on the long, the long term, amen? He's looking and consumed with the jump. But at the same time, even though he's consumed with the jump, he appreciates that parachute. He's going to appreciate and cherish that parachute. He's going to hold on to that parachute, never call it dumb. Amen? Are you with me? You see, in the same way Jesus Christ is our parachute, 
We're on a planet that is under the judgment of Almighty God, and the volcano of His wrath is about to go off. And Jesus Christ uh, is the plane or the flight that is going to get us off of this planet, and He's our parachute that's going to land all of those who turn from sin and self, give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to land softly on heaven's shores. Amen? So, the second coming is a huge part of what should motivate all of us to do what? To be doing the Lord's work, to be witnessing, to be sharing the gospel, uh, to be grateful that we have the Lord Jesus Christ, to be grateful that we know the Lord Jesus Christ, and that He is going to return again. Amen? But if your focus is on comfort and convenience and uh, earthly agendas and problems and fears, like that first guy that was told that the parachute was going to make his life more comfortable, uh, here's what's going to happen. Man, your witness is not going to be as effective. You're going to go through the motions of coming to church. Check. I read my Bible. Check. I witnessed to somebody today. Check. And Man, Christianity is going to become like a checklist. And you're going to go through the motions but not have the heart that you need to have. Not have the affection that you need to have for the Lord. And serving Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Amen? Because He's focused not on the Lord. He's focused on comfort, convenience, and all the other things that can distract you. As if the other man is, he was focused on that jump. Guys, listen, we need to be focused on the Lord. He is our rescue. He is our parachute. Amen? Wow. Jesus coming, besides glorifying God in the Bible, is the second biggest main theme in all the Word of God. Why? Because it's tied directly to the Lord's salvation, His work of salvation, who He is. Amen? So, Man, it's the theme that starts in Genesis and is all the way to the very end of this book, the book of Revelation. He deals with, he's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Now, the first coming of Christ is not just what the Old Testament foretold. It's chock full of the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ starts in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, and it ends in Revelation. You see, this is a doctrine that the devil wants to uh, downplay. This is the doctrine that the devil wants to trip you up in. You see, he wants you to work hard at convenience. He wants you to believe, hey, listen, Jesus is coming, but it's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. Hmm. You see, that wasn't the attitude of the saints. You see, the saints lived that Jesus was going to go back to heaven for a couple weeks and come right back. That's the heart that God wanted them to have. That's the heart that God wants you and I to have. And they had the proper attitude Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there coming a great falling away. The temple be rebuilt. And the Antichrist, at the midpoint of the tribulation, goes into the temple and declares himself to be God and wants to be worshipped as God. These things are not going to take place until these signs be fulfilled. But understand, the rapture, the beginning of the second coming of Christ, when he comes halfway back into the clouds, no signs have to be fulfilled. So the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's two comings made up in three parts. The first time he comes, he's going to come in the rapture, halfway back. And all those that are alive and remain are going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord and all the other saints with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then the Bible says the first time that he came, he came to man, pay for our sins. But the third time he's going to basically come, if you will, is at the very end of the tribulation when he comes all the way back to earth. So there's two comings, the first and the second. The second is made up of three parts, the rapture, and then you have the tribulation period, and then you have when we come back with the Lord, with all the saints, holy angels, to the battle of Armageddon, and then so the Bible says he'll put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And that's when we're going to go into the millennial reign or the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Now, <clears throat> this church was only three weeks old. And so they really believed that they were in the day of the Lord because of the persecution that was going on in Thessalonica. Paul was running out of town on a rail. But he had a lot of young converts, and so he wrote the first time saying, hey listen, King Jesus is coming. The second time he wrote to them in 2 Thessalonians, he wrote to correct the time of the coming of the Lord and told them about those different signs. But listen to what James says. It says, be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth near. Now, when the Word of God says be patient, that means to be of long spirit, according to the Greek. 
it means literally, listen to this, not to lose heart. Be patient. Don't lose heart at the trial or the difficulty that you're going through. Don't lose heart. Keep looking up because King Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Now, from the Lord's perspective, He says, I'm right at the door. I'm right at the door. Remember, the Bible says that one day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So when you look at the second coming from His perspective, just, just two days ago, we know what two days feels like. Amen? Well, God says, listen, 2,000 years is just like two days to you. Just two days ago. So from the Lord's perspective, He really, truly is right at the door. So from His view, man, it's going to happen just like that. He is right there at the door. He says also, uh, man, establish your heart. That means to make firm, to be consistent, uh, to um, be assured, make stable your heart. Why? Because that brings consistency to our life. When we are uh, of long spirit, that means, hey, listen, God is helping you have comfort. Amen? He's, you can be comforted in the fact that he's coming back. You can be comforted in the fact that this place is not your home. It's just your temporary dwelling. He also says there, uh, he also says there, it, it, it produces holy camaraderie or unity. Because he goes on to say, uh, grudge not one against the other, brethren, lest you be, be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. So when you consider the second coming, the Lord wants us to know, hey, listen, man, I'm using the second coming to console you, to comfort you, to establish you. And to keep you on the road that cleanses your heart in anticipation of coming for me because I can come any moment. And what would the Lord find you doing when he came back? If Jesus were to come back yesterday, what would he find you doing? Amen? Did you even think about the Lord's return yesterday? Did you wake up and have anticipation that this might be the day the Lord would come? There's a lot of Christians that don't have that anticipation at all. In fact, it doesn't even go through their mind. Wow. Now children abide in him. And when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, according to 1 John 2, 28. So it keeps us on the road in the clean path. It strengthens our heart. It builds our confidence. So the anticipation of the Lord coming does all those things for our hearts. Amen? It should motivate us all the more to urge everyone that we love, everyone that we live with, everyone that we abide with, everyone that we come across to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Why? Because God's heart also says this concerning his return. Looking at the book of Jude, he says this in verse 14. And Enoch prophesied of these saying, these meaning false teachers. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. Of all their hard speeches, which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Why? Beloved, remember uh, the word that were spoken before of the apostles? Remember how they told you that when Jesus Christ comes, there are going to be mockers in the last days? Remember that? Well, guys, that's why he's saying, hey, listen. You're going to be motivated to share Christ because he's coming. And when he does come, it's going to be too late for those who have not had a chance. Or too late for those who have had a chance to hear the gospel. So I'm glad that the Lord delays because he says, hey, listen, consider the Lord's delay as long-suffering. Long-suffering, why does he have long-suffering? Because he wants all to be saved. Amen? The Lord is not slow or slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, Peter says, but is not willing that any should perish. So that's why he's long-suffering. He's long-waiting because he wants people to be saved. That's his heart. I heard this statement, and I agree with it. God is most glorified in you when you are truly most satisfied in Him. Let me say that again. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. Let me explain what that means. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. He goes on to say in Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that a man or a woman shall speak, they shall render an account of it in the day of judgment, and by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. You see, every time you open your mouth, your heart is on parade. That's how we can tell what's in your heart. That's how we can tell what you're passionate about. So Jesus is going to look back over your life. He's going to examine every word that you've ever said, and he is going to determine just like that how passionate you were in your anticipation of his second coming. Did it motivate you? Did it help you to be grateful and thankful that he was coming and that you knew him? Amen? 
boy. You see, <clears throat> when a guy gets a new hot rod or a car, what does he do? Does he just keep it to himself? Or does he go around and drive around, find his buddies, and show his buddies his new car? And what does he do when he shows them? He talks about it, amen? Why does he talk about it so much? Because it satisfies him. Amen? When a young lady is proposed in marriage, what does, she, what does she do? She goes around with that hand out, look at my ring, look at my ring. Why? Because it satisfies her heart. You see, you talk about what you're satisfied, what satisfies you. You talk about what actually satisfies and brings joy to your heart. Amen? And my friend, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be the one that satisfies you the most. He should be in every conversation that you have, pretty much. Amen? When people walk away, they say, Lord, really know more about the Lord than they know about you, in most cases. Amen? Does Christ come from your heart? Can somebody say, hey, this person's really passionate about Christ. They're really talking a lot about who he is. Amen? Boy. You see, what were the very first words of Jesus? Well, in Mark 1, 15, he said, repent and believe the gospel. You see, you and I and the world was on his heart. He's passionate about seeing people what? Saved. That's why he came, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What were the very last words that Jesus said when he was taken into heaven? Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power. Amen. After the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you shall be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So what was on his mind? The gospel. What was on his mind when he left? The gospel. What is his whole point of the second coming? It's a rescue mission. Ever since the fall of mankind, God Almighty went into full bore on a rescue mission to come and rescue you and to rescue me. And he did it in two parts. The first coming and the second coming is all about you. It's all about a rescue mission. Amen? Amen. Boy. Mm. But I'm... I believe there's many Christians who hear about Christ coming, they believe that He's coming back, but they're not fully convinced that it's going to be in their lifetime. They're not convinced that it could be the next hour, the next second, the next minute. They're just not convinced. And they're unmotivated in sharing. They're unmotivated. And their anticipation and their appreciation is not where it needs to be. God said, you are to establish your heart and the coming of the Lord draweth near. Now, he said that 2,000 years ago to people that really believed that he was coming back right, right back in a few weeks, and yet they had the right heart. You see, I think we can all suffer from that old adage, out of sight, out of mind. Well, I don't see him, so therefore, he's out of my mind. He's out of my heart, if you will. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. A lot of times we live as Christians from our perspective. And when we look at life from our perspective, it dulls us. And it takes away our energy, it takes away our anticipation, it takes away our appreciation when we look at life through our own lenses. That's why we have to look at life through His lenses. Amen? God gave us His Word so that we could have His perspective. Matthew 24, verse 33 there says, So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that I, Jesus, am there, even at the doors. You see... By seeing how many times he expresses himself on the subject of the second coming. It's important to the Lord. You can see that boy is something that is deeply and greatly on his heart. Amen? Wow. Boy, I, I like what the scripture says. It says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 4, listen to what it says. Let us lay aside every weight. That's talking about that baggage and things that, things that can trip us up. And also the sin which so easily besets us. And let us run the race with patience that is set before us, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, this is speaking of Jesus now, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, or the throne of God. For consider him that endured such hostility or contradiction, resistance, rebellion against people, uh, the cruelty that he went, the hostility, the hatred that he went through. So it says, consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. Least you be weary and faint in your minds. You have not resisted sin unto the shedding of blood. Wow. That's what Jesus Christ came for. He says, hey, listen, don't be weary. Don't be weary in heart. Listen, you haven't strived against sin. You weren't crucified for it. I was. Amen. Now, what was that joy that was set before the Lord? The joy that was set before the Lord that he's talking about is you and me. 
So he anticipated his coming because of the joy that was set before him. My friend, listen, the Lord delights in you. He takes joy in you. He wants to come back just as much as you want him to come. In fact, he wants to come back more than you can ever desire for him to come. Why? Because you are his joy that was set before him. Amen? Now understand, his passion was to do God's will, to glorify God first and foremost. But we are the object of His second coming. Amen? He came two times because that was God the Father's will for Him. So He wants to glorify God. That's His passion, to fulfill the will of Almighty God. But at the same time, He wants us to know that we are the object of His second coming. We're the focus of why He's coming. Have you ever considered that? Amen? And I love this verse, Hebrews 10, 9. Lo, I've come to do Thy will, O God, to take away... Uh, the Old Testament, and to establish the second, the new, by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, speaking of Christ, he has perfected forever, uh, perfected forever those who are sanctified, having therefore uh, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. You see, it's all about the Lord Jesus' love for his Father, uh, loving who his father was to satisfy and fulfill God's, the Father's will. But at the same time, the second coming was the passion of God the Father because he sent his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to do what? To come. You see, it not only is it God the Father's passion, but Jesus also willingly anticipated coming as well, doing what he did for us and for, for the world. Wow. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> that warms my heart knowing that the second coming is all about you. It's all about the world. It's all about me. Amen? He says this in Hebrews 10, 36 and 37, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, just like Jesus did for God the Father, you might receive the promises of God. Now listen, what are the promises that he gave to us? For yet a little while, and he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. God promises you that his son Jesus is coming back. Jesus is more eager to come and rescue and receive you to himself than you could ever want him to come himself. You see, understand, you've got to look at it from his perspective. The Lord wants to come back. The Lord loves you, cares for you. You can see that on Calvary's cross. If you can't see how much the Lord loves you on Calvary... Now let me invite you once again to go to Calvary and explore all the wounds of Christ because all those wounds were for you. He downloaded all your sin, past, present, and future into his body. Suffer the wrath of God so that you wouldn't have to. My friend, that is unspeakable love, is it not? Amen. And that same passion is the same passion that he has for you today. Jesus Christ, whether you want him to come or not, wants to come. And he's anticipating that day that he sees you face to face. You remember Stephen? How the Bible says that when Stephen was being stoned, what does the Bible say Jesus was doing? And the Bible says that Stephen looked up into heaven and he said, hey, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He wasn't sitting, he was standing. Why? Because Jesus stood up for his martyr Stephen. Why? Because he was anticipating Stephen getting to heaven so that he could be with him forever. Amen? And in the same way, Jesus Christ anticipates you and I to get to heaven. That's why the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord or the death of his saints. See, it's precious in his sight. Why? Because he gets to be with you for all eternity, and you get to be with him. Amen? So when you think about the second coming of Christ, you've got to think about it from his perspective, how his heart is, and his heart aches to come back for you. Amen? I mean, have you ever had a, a, a good friend say, hey, I'm going to come over next week? You got a relative out of town that says, hey, I'm going to come over, spend about three days with you? Now, some of you are probably saying, well, now, Brother Dave, there's some relatives that... <laughs> It says, it says, it says uh, uh, backing up lights are, are the best lights that I ever see. Amen? But you know what I'm talking about. And there's an anticipation. There's an excitement to be able to see somebody that's coming that you've missed for a long time. Amen? Well, take that and times that by infinity. And that's how the Lord feels about you. And meeting you. And taking you to meet him in the air with the rest of the saints. Amen? Wow. Boy. Listen to this, guys. Before we dive into signs and all those things, you've got to know his heart. You have to know his heart. In Genesis 3.15, the Bible says this. that talks about the woman's seed. And that woman's seed is Jesus. So that's the first time the first coming of Christ was mentioned, was in Genesis 
He was having a conversation with Eve and the devil. And he said to the woman, your seed, speaking of Christ, will bruise, uh, will, will, speaking of, you will bruise his heel, referring to Satan, bruising the heel of Jesus. But then he said, but his heel, the Lord's heel, will crush your head on Calvary's cross. Now he didn't say it there in that verse, but that's exactly what that verse is talking about. So we see the first coming mentioned to us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So God said, when man fell, listen, I have been on a rescue mission. That's what the second coming is all about. And you are the object of that rescue mission. You're my passion. You're my love. You're my joy that's set before me. Listen to what 1 John 3, 5 says. He had a handle on it. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifest to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Listen to this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, or He came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, He came to destroy the works of the devil His first coming. But the second time He comes, He's going to destroy that pretend son of the devil called the Antichrist by the brightness of His coming and the sword of His mouth when we show up to the battle of Armageddon. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible says that he will destroy him by the sword or the word of his mouth. And as I've said a million times, I'm going to say it again. Hopefully he'll look at the Antichrist and the false prophet and say, drop dead. And the Bible says that they're cast into the lake of fire. Amen? Boy. So he tells us, listen, I've defeated the devil. I've defeated sin. I've defeated the grave. I've defeated everything that needs defeated. You are super conquerors in me. Anticipate the fact that I love you and that I'm coming soon. Amen? Wow. You see, his coming is that important to him that he would mention it over 2,100 times in the Bible. How much more important should it be to us? Knowing his heart. Amen? Boy. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And in thy seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He was telling, telling Abraham, hey, listen, I'm coming. Amen? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Verse number three, this is the second time that the second coming is mentioned in the Old Testament. Not the first coming, but this is the second place, the second time, the second coming is mentioned. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 30, verse three. Then the Lord God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather you from all nations. Well, in order for all the nations and all the places that God's people were scattered because of their disobedience, God says in the last days he's going to Bring all his people back to Israel. Well, that couldn't happen until the Berlin Wall fell down. And the Iron Curtain over there in Russia fell down. And that bear wouldn't hibernate uh, for a while. Well, that bear is waking back up. According to the Word of God, Russia will wake back up. They're going to be a big player in the end times. But understand, all those people, when those walls came down, many people went back to, uh, to Israel. So we have lots of prophecy already being fulfilled concerning the coming of of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, of that second coming event. Let me ask you a question. Where is the very first mention of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? Do you know? Where's the very first time God said, hey, listen, my son's going to come the first time and die for your sins. He's going to be the Messiah, your Savior. But he's going to also come a second time to establish rule and authority. He's going to rule and reign on this earth. 4,000 years. Where's that mentioned in the Bible, Brother Dave? Where's the very first time? Do you know where it's at? All right, well, I'm going to tell you where it's at, guys. It's in the book of Job. Job chapter 19, verse 23 and 27. Job chapter 19, verse 23 and 27. Listen to this. Now, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. This was over way, 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 way over 2,000 years ago. And I want you to look at Job's heart because Job had the right heart. And thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth. He had the right perspective. He had the right heart. And Jesus wasn't going to show up for over 2,000 years, but yet he still had that anticipation that he had to have. And we need to have. I love this verse. Listen to what Job says through the power of the Holy Spirit. He says this in chapter 19, verse 23 and 27. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, God answered his prayer. His words were written in the book of eternity. And put into this book, well, the words will never pass away. Amen? Well, I love this. Listen to this. He says this. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in a rock. Well, God did a better thing than that. He didn't put them in a rock. He put them in the book of eternity. Amen? 
Boy, listen to what he says. Now, here's his heart. Here's his heart now. He says that they were led in the book forever. You can see his passion. Verse 25, for I know. Listen to what he says now. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And after my skin worm shall destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. He was looking forward to the day where Jesus Christ would come all the way back with the saints and put his feet on the Mount of Olives. Amen. And he said, I shall see God with my own eyes. He had the anticipation that, that God was coming back. You can see his passion. You can sense that it motivated his life. It motivated all that he did because he had that anticipation that, hey, King Jesus can come back at any moment. Amen. Now, he didn't know Jesus name but he was referring to Yahweh God but we know who Yahweh is he is the Lord Jesus amen from his perspective and when you go all throughout the scripture oh man listen uh, they were eager and it motivates them it strengthened them it cleansed them it comforted them and it gave them uh, consolation it filled them with anticipation it filled them with appreciation and we need to have that same heart when it comes to the second coming of Christ Amen. Psalm 2, Jeremiah 30, Amos chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 9, Daniel chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 14, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Peter, Jude, and Revelation. All those books contain the second coming of Christ over and over and over again. God says, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. If Jesus said... He was coming the first time, 333 times. Did he come? Yeah. He sure did, amen? All he had to do was say it once, and he would have what? He would have came, amen? But he said it 333 times. Well, guys, he says to us, concerning the second coming, over 2,000 times, do you think Jesus is coming back? Yeah. Amen, he absolutely is coming back. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 12, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 20, surely I come quickly. My friend, I believe from the Lord's perspective, His hand is right at the door. His hand is about to touch that doorknob when it comes to these end time events that are taking place, that have taken place, that are taking place right now here today. And we're going to look at those signs next week. We're going to get into the signs. But before we get into the signs, God laid on my heart to let you know, hey, listen, you need to know His heart. He's anticipating coming back for you. You're his joy. You're his delight. Man, he gave his life. He gave his all for you. And that's why he says it's a reasonable service. <clears throat> man, to renew our minds. Why? Because, and present yourself a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. That doesn't mean just come to church and fill a pew. Amen. That's the, that's the least we could do. The least we could be faithful in. But man, it means to serve him. It means to love him. It means to worship him. It means to... Be that witness for Him. It means to live that clean life. It means to have that life that truly glorifies God to the best of your ability so that when people look at your life, they can tell there's a difference in your heart and in your life. And that King Jesus does make a difference. Amen? And that He's still in this soul-saving, life-changing business today. Because He is. Amen? I don't know about you, but I, in studying this, I know it claimed the flame of my heart. It fanned the flames of my heart. And thinking about Christ coming back. Amen? I pray with all my heart that it's flame, that it stands your flames as your heart as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. And as the piano begins to softly play, Lord, your word does not return void. Lord, you promise that. So Lord, I just pray now that you would take the word that was sown today. That, Lord, you would water each and every heart. Christian, I'm asking you, where's your anticipation level of Jesus coming back? Do you wake up and not even think about it? Do you wake up and say, well, I know he's coming, but probably not today? Because you don't really know. He could come back right now. No signs have to be fulfilled for Christ to take his church in the rapture. None. No one knows how long that generation is. That generation could end tomorrow and Jesus could come back tomorrow because we don't know how long that generation is. But he did say that those that see that day 
That generation would not pass away. So we are at the end of the beginning, guys. I believe that with all my heart. Do you believe that with all your heart? It'll reflect in your life. It'll reflect in your joy. It'll reflect, reflect on what you're focused on and what you're concerned about. I know we have daily burdens and concerns and heartaches and things that weigh us down. But nevertheless, is your focus on Christ? Is your focus... Is your heart filled with appreciation that, man, He loves you, that you know Him and that He claims you as His own because you truly did repent of your sin and put your trust in Him? Do you have Bible confidence that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Lord claims you as His own? If He were to come right now, would you go in the rapture or would you sit right where you're at, occupying that same key? Has there been a time in your life where you truly have turned from sin and given your heart and life to Him? You believe that He came and that He died on the cross and that He died in your place and suffered the wrath of God in your place and paid for your sins in full on Calvary. Have you truly went to Him and believed that He died and was buried and that He was raised from the dead with all your heart? Did you tell the Lord personally that you're sorry for your sin and that you're willing to turn from self and sin and you called upon His name to save you? Have you done that? If you want to be saved today, and you know that the Lord is impressed upon you that you need to repent, turn from your sin, and ask Christ to forgive you and save you, I want you to raise your hand. No one looking around and say, Brother Dave, I need to be saved. I want to ask Christ to forgive me and save me. Raise your hand right now. No one looking around. Does it rejoice your heart at all knowing that the Lord anticipates meeting you, willing to stand up off the throne of all thrones to meet you as he did with Stephen? The Bible says that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever, so it's not wrong to think that he would probably stand up off of his throne. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming to meet you because he loves you that much. And he is right at the door. Take a moment right now and just God's laid on your heart to exhale anything in your life, to do less of or more of something in your life. Whatever that may be, do whatever the Lord's told you to do. Take a moment right now and we'll close in prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Ivan when he feels led to close us in prayer. Whenever you feel led, go ahead and close us in prayer.